Hey guys, it's me, Ron Tabor. Time again for our study in John. Uh, today we'll be in John chapter 5, looking at uh, going verse 1 through verse 17. So a lot to cover as we get into this new chapter. But uh, as our manner is, we will first look at John chapter 20, jumping ahead, where uh, John tells us the purpose of this gospel narrative. Why did he write it? And it's really clear, and we'll find out here in John chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, John writes and says, And many other signs or miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, these signs are written, in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So again, we see clearly why John wrote this gospel narrative, the, this narrative of the life and ministry of Jesus on the earth, including his death, burial, and resurrection. And, uh, and we see that uh, he documented specific signs, and we'll see uh, the third uh, of, of this list of specific signs that were documented. Now, John said there were many signs that Jesus did in, in, in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this particular gospel narrative. But these particular ones, these are written uh, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. See, these, the, the works and the miracles that Jesus did testified of his nature, right? Jesus did miracles that, that no other person could do. And these miracles demonstrated that Jesus was and is, in fact, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you'll believe that, you'll believe, you'll come to that conclusion based on this narrative, this testimony of Jesus Christ, that believing you might have life through his name. So eternal life is a gift to the guilty, not a reward for the righteous. Eternal life is a gift that is received by faith, by simply believing. And we're going to get into this today about the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. Um, and, and we're going to look a little bit at the Sabbath day that the Jews, uh, that was, was imparted to Israel through the law of Moses and how that Sabbath rest had been corrupted by the religion of Pharisaical Judaism. Um, but we receive life, we receive eternal life by simply believing the gospel, not joining a church, not making a commitment to improve your moral standing and moral uh, exterior. No, but by simply believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, be that believing you might have life through his name. At the age of 16, I appropriated this grace. Um, by believing upon Jesus Christ, the gospel message was proclaimed to me at my dinner table. I was 16 years old. The pastor who came to correct this wayward boy uh, told me about Jesus Christ and how he died on the cross for my sins and he was buried and he was raised from the dead and he would give me that little scoundrel, scoundrel, 16-year-old uh, whippersnapper uh, that, that God would impart to me eternal life if I would simply believe that gospel narrative, that Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, I instantly was aware of my urgent need for Jesus Christ, and I received him by faith at my dinner table. That's how simple this is. Now I'm 58 years old. I was 16. Now I'm 58. And guess what? I still have eternal life. Don't let the exterior fool you. I have eternal life because I believe in Jesus Christ. And so that's the purpose of this narrative. The word believe is used 99 times or, or a form thereof, believeth or believed, uh, believing or whatever, uh, 99 times. And so we, we kind of make a point of stopping at this word when we find it. Now today we're not going to see the use of this word. And uh, it's a really interesting uh, interesting narrative here in John chapter 5 as we'll look at this we're going to look at another sign miracle that was done and um, I used to believe that everyone that received a miracle from Jesus was a de facto believer but now I know that that was not true and today is one of those instances where we will read about someone who received a miracle healing from Jesus who did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. In fact, this word is not mentioned in this narrative in John chapter 5. So we'll, we'll unpack all that. But uh, anyway, let's, this is going to be a long one as usual. So as I always say, well, I don't always say it, but it's always true. Uh, 
there'll be timestamps and all the passages we'll we'll be talking about will be in there in, in a chronological order that we uh, that I spoke of them and you can jump ahead back and forth and again I go m down much easier at a b about a 1.5 speed if you want to really get through the teaching quickly uh, I can handle myself at a 2.0 because I know my own <laughs> I know my thoughts in advance so it's easier but anyway let's get onto the text John chapter 5 we'll start here in verses 1 through 4 and the scripture says after this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now there was uh, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Beth Bethesda Bethesda having five porches in these in these porches lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind of halt or 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 the the crippled the the limping uh, withered so impotent folk of blind halt withered waiting for the moving of the water for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole now this is going to be an important phrase that's repeated throughout this segment of scripture verses 1 through 17 and we'll unpack this as we move along but anyone that stepped in the water first was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So we see here in these first four verses the setting for the miracle that, that Jesus is going to perform, this sign that identifies him as a Messiah, a testimony. Uh, this work will testify of Jesus that he is the Christ. And oh boy, when we, we get further into John chapter 5, the teaching of, of Jesus here uh, makes it abundantly clear uh, that that um, if you've seen Jesus, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Jesus is God in human flesh. Um, but we'll get more into that, and we we get back back uh, after chapter. Uh, excuse me, after verse 17, we'll we'll see Jesus' dialogue that reveals his deity to the Pharisees and to the Jewish leadership. <clears throat> but anyway, we're here at this setting. So we have a feast of the Jews, and um, <clears throat> it's a. Uh, the Passover feast, he's come back. This is one year since he, he uh, back in John chapter 2, it was the, the Passover feast. And so now we've got a one year out of three uh, of the ministry of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and uh, so he goes back to Jerusalem. And uh, now we get a little detail about this pool, Pool of Bethesda. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, like Bethesda, Maryland. And the word Bethesda means house of kindness. So <clears throat> the pool is called Bethesda, which means house of kindness. It had five porches or five entry points into this pool. In this lay a great multitude of impotent folk. Um, so we're going to see words here now for uh, multiple words, or, or at least three words here, not multiple, but three words here describing the condition of, the, the the feebleness of the people who've gathered. And we first here, we see impotent. And the word impotent means without strength, impotent. Um, also, I was thinking, this is a word that I associated with it, dysfunctional, dysfunctional. <clears throat> I was looking at the commentary of uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee on this text, and I loved his quote. <clears throat> this narrative we're going to read here uh, is when the impotent meet the omnipotent Christ, when the impotent meet the omnipotent Christ. And that's what's going to happen here for this, this impotent man. <clears throat> We're going to read about shortly. Uh, the impotent man is going to meet the omnipotent Christ who will make him whole. So first we see this word, they're impotent. They are, and, and the impotence is described, uh, they're blind, they're halt, or they're, they're uh, crippled, unable to walk, limping. And withered, we read about Jesus healing a man who had a withered hand, making it whole. So these are this is a, a brief description of those who have assembled. And notice it says a great multitude. So it's not just a handful of folks. There's a lot of people here who are hoping to have a miracle. 
Uh, for the angel went down at a certain time. They're waiting for the moving of the water, and an angel would go down at a certain season into the pool, troubled the water, stirred the water up, and whosoever the first one, uh, whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So in this instance, you would say, you know, that the withered probably had a, a greater chance of getting in the water than the crippled or the blind. The blind would not see the water stirring and know to jump in. <clears throat> the crippled couldn't get in because of the very fact that they're crippled, they would, it, and this man makes it clear, it's, it's, um, it's impossible for him to get in first to be healed. And so the, the withered had the greatest advantage in stepping in first and being made whole. But notice the next word we see here is the word disease. It says, uh, the troubling of the water, uh, whoever first stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So the word disease is interesting. And when you look at it and break it down in English, uh, it starts with the prefix D-I-S or dis, the prefix dis. And it means separated, uh, separated from, asunder, uh, severed. So it, 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 it's, it's bringing this definition of, of separation. Um, uh, and, and disease, dis-ease, the word ease means well-being. So a person is diseased is separated from a state of well-being. Uh, and again, coming back to this dysfunctional, they're separated from functionality. So the, the person with the eyes, diseased eyes, the eyes are separated from seeing. They're dysfunctional eyes. They're separated from the functionality of seeing. A person who is crippled, their legs are separated from function. They are not walking. There is something disabling, <laughs> disability, separated from the ability to function, functionality. Uh, also, the, the, the prefix dis uh, means asunder. That's a good King James word, to cut asunder. Uh, that means to... Uh, to separate into parts or pieces. And, man, I pictured a, a nice china uh, a dish, a china uh, a dish of china, <laughs> that's what you call it. And, and just imagine someone smashing that on concrete, and that thing that was whole has now been shattered or fragmented into all these hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces that it would be impossible to make it whole again. And so this is a great image that we are looking at, that Jesus Christ is going to make someone whole. He's going to take these, these separated pieces and dysfunctionality and make them whole. And so he's going to do this for this man in particular, but it is a picture of salvation. When the impotent meet the omnipotent Christ, they are made whole, they are made complete. And, and this is really... Uh, when you go back to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace, but it means really at its core, it means completeness, completeness. You're, you're made complete or whole. You're, you're made one again. And we're going to see how our union with Jesus Christ, our reconciliation with Jesus Christ is how God makes us whole again and in the inward man. And then our outward man ultimately will be made whole of all of its ailments, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, at the resurrection. And so Jesus Christ, this is a picture of Jesus Christ making the dysfunctional, making the things that are shattered into pieces, the human, human lives that are shattered into fragments, he's going to make them whole. And, and how did he do that? Well, he bore our sin on the cross. He bore our weakness and infirmity on the cross himself. He was punished in our place of vicarious substitutionary uh, sacrifice. And his sacrifice appeased or made peace, reconciled a man with God. And, uh, <clears throat> and so through his death on the cross, he reconciles or uh, rejoins us unites us with God and from this this dysfunctional uh, relationship uh, a relationship of hostility and enmity he reconciles and brings peace so all these things are kind of packed in here and I want to kind of talk about these things as we go through the text but anyway this is the setting Jesus is here at this pool and now we pick up the text in verse 5 verse 5 through 9 says, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity or a weakness or a feebleness, an infirmity. 
okay, a sickness, about 38, 30 and 8 years. So this man is, is crippled, has been crippled, unable to walk for 38 years. And he's waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to help him get into the water when it's stirred. And it's, go back, going back to the first passages up here, it says uh, in verse 4, An angel went down at a certain season into the pool. And so it, it, to me it seems to imply that there was a predictability when the waters would stir. And of course here we are at the feast, the feast of the Passover, the Jews are assembled, and so it, it seems it's around this season that the stirring of the water occurred and, and, and an individual could be made whole. So here's this certain man with infirmity 30 and 8 years. And Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? There's that phrase again. Wilt thou be made whole? Verse 7, The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. At this point, uh, I think this man is uh, basically hoping that Jesus will, will volunteer to be that man that's sitting by his side waiting for the stirring of the water and to, will lift him up and put him in the waters. But what he doesn't realize is that the impotent has now met the omnipotent Christ and he doesn't need to wait for the stirring of the waters. He's greater than the angel that comes and brings that, <clears throat> that uh, exclusive healing. Verse 8, <clears throat> Jesus gets right to the chase, as he always does. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. There's that phrase again, he was made whole. Now, of course, we are speaking here uh, in the physical context. Uh, it's a physical healing. Uh, and it says, uh, He was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, this is where things get a little bit dicey. But before we talk about that, let's just look at this. Notice again, Jesus merely speaks the word unto this man. It's the Sabbath day, and he merely speaks healing to this man. He says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, when Jesus does this, Jesus never does anything randomly, haphazardly, or without um, intention. He never had an idle word that he spoke. Uh, we have idle words all the time. Uh, we're <laughs> infamous for that. Uh, oh, no, I was just joking about that. I, I wasn't serious. I was just joking, you know. Uh, we'll cover up uh, faux pas by saying that. Well, oh, I was just kidding around, you know. Um, we use idle words a lot, words that we wish we could take back. Well, Jesus never did that. He spoke exactly what the Father told him to speak, and every miracle that he performed was fulfilling the work that the Father had commanded in heaven. There was no disconnect or no randomness to the ministry of Jesus Christ. So everything that he has done here, healing this man and then commanding him to take up his bed and walk, are intentional. And we're going to see here that this, this miracle is really designed for a confrontation with the religion of the day, the Pharisaical Judaism <clears throat> that was that was masked and masquerading as uh, <clears throat> worship and obedience to God. It had absolutely nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with the tradition of men, uh, nothing to do with pleasing and worshiping God. So this miracle is intentional, uh, as they all were, and he did it by the spe by his speech, which, by the way, speaking on the Sabbath day, I think, was permitted. Even the, ph the Pharisees would allow you to speak, right, on, on the Sabbath day. So this is all Jesus has done. He's given a commandment. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. So this really is a throwdown. He's going to expose the hypocrisy uh, and the, the error of Pharisaical Judaism, as the Jews now are going to catch wind of this. We'll see next the, the religion police, they are on top of this. Um, and, uh, and he is going to, it's a time for confrontation with Jesus uh, and to expose their hypocrisy. So now let's look at verses 
10 through 13. <clears throat> the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. All right, so here's the first point of contention. What are you doing carrying your bed? And I can see them. I mean, I picture, you know, Saudi Arabia and some of these extremist uh, Muslim countries where they have the religion police and they, they beat you with a stick if you're violating it. Uh, I don't see them beating, but they're certainly there watching. The watchful eye of the religious faithful, man, is, is always gazing upon others to be critical of them and to get them in line. Verse 11, uh, he, the man that was healed, he answered them, and uh, he that made me whole, there's that phrase again, he was dysfunctional, he was diseased, he was impotent, uh, his, he was crippled, and now he's been made whole. He has been made functional, and he's standing and walking and carrying his bed. He answered them and said, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? Now this is fascinating at this point. This man tells them that a miracle has occurred. They're standing at the pool uh, with, it says, a great multitude of impotent folk. And this man has just been made whole. And he says, he that made me whole. You see all these impotent people here? I was one of them. And this man came and made me whole. He told me to take up my bed and walk. And so they ask, what man is it which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? The miracle goes right over their head. They don't even, it's like it didn't even phase them. It's like bullets off a of Superman. They are oblivious to the work that Jesus did, and they are furious that he told this man to get up and walk and carry his bed. Oh, my goodness, who is this carrying their bed? I mean, you talk about straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. This is what these people are doing. And oh, by the way, that we'll get into this. There is no prohibition against <clears throat> carrying a mat on the Sabbath day. These are the additional rules and commandments and regulations heaped upon heap upon heap upon heap of, of burdens that was yoked upon the people through Pharisaical Judaism. And Jesus violated their tradition and the commandments of men. He did not violate the commandments of God given in the Old Testament as far as uh, how the Sabbath day, uh, how one was to function the Sabbath day. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so this is, they're, they're just, mm, who told you to walk? They, they carry this bed. They, they, they're like, wait a minute, you were healed? You know, hey, hey this is a messianic uh, work here. We should investigate this. Nope, uh, you're up, you're walking, you're carrying your bed. Um, in verse 13, now the man, uh, it says, and he that was healed with snot or did not know, who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So we read that earlier, a great multitude is there. And so he just kind of faded back out, faded into the crowd, and he, this man doesn't know who it was. And this is interesting in and of itself, that, that the, man, the man did not intentionally seek out Jesus or, or, or seek to dialogue with him or even uh, to express gratitude. Uh, and, and he doesn't even know who Jesus was. And this is a clue. This man is not a believer. He has not come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, and as we go through this, there's no indication that he ever did um, come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Um, but, but so right here, he, it says, he wist not who it was. He doesn't know. He doesn't say, the Messiah has healed me. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Compare this with the man in, in, uh, in John chapter 9. I believe it is John chapter 9, the man that was born blind. Compare this man's dialogue with the Pharisees and the, the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin, um, and compare the, the dialogue with the man that was born blind that was healed, who defends Jesus. 
And even though he does not at the moment know that he is the Messiah, he knows he is sent from God and ultimately does believe that he is the Messiah. We'll see that man in heaven, the man in John chapter 9. But this man does not have really any interest in this miracle worker that has made him whole. It's, it's kind of... Uh, he's, it's kind of lost on him as well. Um, so anyway, um, Jesus had, had kind of hid himself away, a multitude being in that place. So now at this point, I want to just kind of take a parenthetical pause and look at the Sabbath day and, uh, and, and kind of understand what God actually commanded the Jews to do on the Sabbath day or not to do and what tradition had commanded. And again, Pharisaical Judaism was all about the tradition of the elders, the tradition of the of the fathers of Israel, not the commandments of God. And so they they cloaked uh, under the name of worshiping the true and living God. Uh, they used that as a cloak for their religious system, which God despised. And that's what it is really for a man's heart to be distant from God, his mouth uh, drawing near with your mouth, but their heart being distant. So let's look at Matthew 15, verse 7 through 9, which basically is what says this. Jesus speaking, Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Well, what does it mean to have their heart far from God? Verse 9, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Okay, so this is the, the narrative, the overarching narrative of the religion of Pharisaical Judaism. They were teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, but with their mouths they were saying, Oh, bless God, we're worshiping God, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We worship Him. The God that spoke to Moses, we worship him. And then they would substitute the commandments of God and they would put in their traditions. So at this point, I looked at Dr. Fruchtenbaum's uh, teaching on this. Uh, they, they had added, at the time of Jesus, the, the, the Pharisees and all the religious, <laughs> the, the centuries of, of religious uh, traditions, they had added... 50, excuse me, 1,500 regulations onto the Sabbath day, all right? And, uh, and one of the commandments was that they could not carry uh, a mattress or a pad like this from a public place to a private place or vice versa. So here's this man getting up in a public place, uh, headed to his home, no doubt, and, and the Pharisees say, oh, what are you doing? You're violating our commandment but not the commandment of God. And, and they incorporated that into the Sabbath day, and that's why they ultimately will see they'll want to slay, uh, they'll want to kill Jesus over this, thinking that he has violated the, the Sabbath day, which he has not. So now, uh, so we see the tradition of commandments of men have, have saturated Jewish life, and now particularly the Sabbath day. Uh, now look at Exodus chapter 20. We'll look at that, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, and see what God actually prescribed for the Sabbath day. So we pick up the text, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. The word for labor uh, means to serve or to till the land. Okay, it's arduous labor. It's, it's bringing forth sweat here. Um, thou shalt, in six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. The word for work here means your employment. You're nine to five, baby. You, you've got six days to do your nine to five work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The word Sabbath uh, at its core means an intermission, a time out, a break. Okay, so six days, you've got labor, 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 toiling, laboring. And the seventh day is intermission, the time out. You're to rest on that day. Okay, thou shalt do, thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy. Okay, so here in the context of thou shalt, thou shalt not do any work, the context of thou shalt not do any work is in the context of your Monday through Friday employment, as we say here in the United States. We have two days off. Uh, well, we have those days we don't f usually go into our place of employment. Now, we may still be uh, in violation of the Sabbath day that was commanded to Israel. It's not a Gentile commandment. And under the church, we're no longer under the law. <clears throat> it's not binding upon anyone uh, in the church. Uh, as Christ has done away with the commandments, they were nailed to the cross. He has fulfilled them, and the schoolmaster now brings us to Christ. We are not to go back to the schoolmaster and seek to please God through law-keeping. Um, but nevertheless, what we see here is the context of you're not to work, so you stop doing this laboring and toiling and sweating uh, that you do. So, uh, you've got six days to do that, but on this day, you don't do any of that. And it's true not only for the, the person reading, but your son, your daughter, you're not to compel them to work, your manservant, your maidservant. In other words, you take it easy that day, but make them labor. Uh, cattle or strangers within thy gates, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, God was working for six days in the creation, the sea and all that in them is, and rested. And to rest is to cease from labor. That is the definition of rest, to cease from your labor. And I like to think of, uh, I've seen the word used repose also, and I just like picturing, you know, the, you're taking a rest, you're laying in a hammock. I mean, that is, just picture yourself on a beautiful beach somewhere, lying in a hammock. That is the... the uh, a quintessential definition of rest. You're just not doing anything. You're being supported by this hammock you know, of grace. So, so as we transfer that over to the grace of God. <clears throat> it says, uh, God rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, the word hallow means to make holy. And uh, so six days are profane. Uh, you've got the profane, which is working, okay? And profane means the common. This is what's common. The, the routine, the common routine is you work, except for one day, the Sabbath day. It is a holy day. It is a separated day. It is not, it is not a day of work and labor and toil and sweat, okay? It is a day for rest, and it's why it's called a holy day. It's separated. And the Sabbath day is a blessing. It is to be a blessing to man. And of course, we'll see here that religion is going to take a blessing from God and flip it on its head and make it a burdensome yoke. That's what religion does. If you're in a religion, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. The religious demands, the, the, uh, the, the, the leering eye of, of the, uh, the, the holy ones, the leaders, uh, making sure you're doing, you're being obedient to the religious system and the commandments of the religion. So that's what man has done to the Sabbath day, and particularly the Jews in, in Jesus' time. Um, Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, Jesus adds some clarity, more clarity to the Sabbath day as he engages with the Pharisees and Sadducees over this. Mark 2, 27, 28, he says, uh, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So the first thing we see here about the Sabbath, it was made for man. And we just read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, that, the, that God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy or separate, sanctified that day, set it apart from the profane of working to the holy rest uh, <clears throat> that God had provided in that day because he ceased from his labors and man also was to cease from their labors on the seventh day, the Sabbath day. Uh, so the Sabbath was made for man as a blessing. Man was not made for the Sabbath, which is what the, the Pharisees were doing. They were making man subservient to the day itself. Uh, 
and, and putting all these burdens and yoke upon them that was not part of the Mosaic commandment for the Sabbath day. So, um, so, so the next thing we see here in Mark uh, 2, 28, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So Jesus, of course, uh, consistently is doing healings, miracles on the Sabbath day, very intentionally, uh, uh, he, he's coming and, and challenging in total disregard. Uh, he is in total disregard and disdain for the commandments of men that, that yoke people, where the Sabbath becomes not a, a blessing, but a burden. That's what religion was doing. And so we see here, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Uh, folks, he's the one, you're looking at the one, when you're talking to Jesus, the Pharisees, they're looking at the one who authored and uh, and commanded the Sabbath. He is Lord of the Sabbath, and he knows what is permitted and what is not. He is the Sabbath expert, okay, because he is Lord of the Sabbath. So we, we kind of glean these truths here from Mark 2, 27 and 28. The Sabbath was made for man. It's to be a blessing for man and not man for the Sabbath. Uh, religion makes and turns a, a blessing of God into a yoke of bondage using the same label. So they'll still call it Sabbath, Sabbath rest, but they make it burdensome, okay? And yet they call it a rest. That's, that's a good tell, you know, in religion that the label doesn't fit what you're actually doing. Uh, it's a euphemism to, uh, to disguise the burden that they're placing on you, as religion does. Uh, the Sabbath was a blessing for man, and Jesus is Lord and author of the Sabbath, or the intermission, the cessation of labor. Okay, now we'll look at Numbers chapter 15, verse 32 through 36, to see the severity of actual violation of the Sabbath day and kind of ponder, why is this so severe? Uh, Numbers chapter 15, verse 32 through 36. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done unto him. So they're holding him in a, 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 a holding cell until they figure out what to do with this guy. The Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. So here we see in, in, in other places in the Old Testament, uh, in the Pentateuch, it was commanded that if a man violated the Sabbath day, he was to be stoned to death, he was to, to die. Um, and you think about it, here's this man, this, he's simply gathering sticks on the Sabbath day, and they find him picking up sticks and they stone him to death. And the natural question is, why such a severe punishment for what seems to be such a minor infraction that you're working on a day of rest? And when you think about it, it becomes pretty clear why that is. Because the Sabbath rest is a picture of our salvation. And it is by grace that we are saved through faith. And it is a gift of God, it is not of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Salvation is not of works. And any man that tries to put in any, even the smallest, most menial task as a requirement with the grace of God, if he blends works and grace together, he will end up in the lake of fire. He will not be saved because he is adding his own self-righteous effort, even if it's something as small and minor as picking up sticks, even if it's as something as small and minor as saying, I must repent of my sins and trust the Savior. It's a partnership uh, of my labor and Jesus' uh, work on the cross. It is that partnership uh, that's going to save me. No. It will bring your destruction. It will bring an eternal uh, presence abiding in the lake of fire. It will end in eternal, the second death, the lake of fire. If you add the smallest work to the work of Jesus Christ, we are to rest in Jesus Christ, to cease from all of our 
labors and efforts in order to be saved and simply believe in Christ. That's why this picture is so, it's so hard to comprehend. It seems such a small infraction. Why is it the death penalty? Because the day had been hallowed, set apart, and it is a picture of not only our salvation, but the entire Christian life is that of the faith rest. Okay, that's what it's all about. Resting in Jesus Christ, who does all the work on our behalf. Just as he did all the work necessary to make this man whole, Jesus Christ has done all the work necessary for us to receive a spiritual wholeness or eternal life through him by simply believing, not by changing our paths, not by cleaning up the, uh, the outside of the, of the cup. Okay, not by uh, making promises and pledges to be uh, more faithful and, and obedient and kinder and nicer and try harder and do more. Uh, repenting daily, you know, demonstrating, therefore, that we have not measured up. If you've got to repent daily of your sins and you're acknowledging, I have not ceased from my sinning, I keep doing it. Okay, so you're testifying by your daily repentance of your sins okay that you are a worker of iniquity that's what you're doing just like the jews every time they brought a sacrifice to the temple they are acknowledging that yes they had sinned since the last time they offered a sacrifice they are acknowledging there is a testimony that they are continuing to sin that they are workers of iniquity all right so um this is why the sabbath day had such a harsh penalty because it is a picture of our salvation and we see in Ephesians 2 8 9 which I kind of paraphrase but we see here for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast so folks if you are trying to work in a partnership with a salvation partnership with Jesus Christ I assure you that your future will not be in heaven, it will be in the lake of fire, because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We cannot merit our salvation by our works. We can only receive it uh, as a grace gift by faith. And faith is, as we see in the text, not of works. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, it is not of works lest any man should boast. Okay? So that's why the severity. So we, we go a little bit further. We can kind of see why the Jews wanted to slay Jesus, but, but why were they wanting to do that? Because their traditions were violated. Their Sabbath traditions and the commandments of men had been violated, not the commandment of God. Jesus did nothing worthy of death. All right? Um... Let's see, I had another passage I was going to read uh, uh, on the Sabbath day. I didn't get it down, but Jesus, uh, let's see, in Matthew, um, hmm. what, chat, what was that verse? Um, in in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 4, let me pull that up real quick. Mark chapter 3, verse 4. Jesus, who is Lord of the Sabbath, tells the Jews in Mark chapter 3, verse 4, as he's going to heal a man with a withered hand, he saith unto them, unto the, the Pharisees and the Jews there, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And they held their peace. He was angry with them because of the hardness of their hearts. He said unto them, Send of the man, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out. His hand was restored, whole as the other. There's that word whole. The Pharisees went forth and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So Jesus, by doing this, um, he's demonstrating that it is, it is virtuous and good to do good on the Sabbath. That's not the verse I was looking for, though. So let's see here. Uh... Well, I'm not going to pull that up just for the sake of time. But basically, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. Jesus emphatically says that. 
So, all right, let's get back to the text here. Um, so, so we're talking about the Sabbath day and the, uh, the 1,500 regulations have been added. Jesus in commanding this man to take up his, his bed and, and to walk uh, has violated the commandments of the Jews and this has made them furious. So they're oblivious to the miracle that was done and they, all they see is the violation of their commandment, which is most important to them. Um, <clears throat> now we pick up a verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him, finds this man in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So notice in, in all of this, this interaction between Jesus and this impotent man whom he made whole, it is Jesus that is constantly seeking this man out. This man has no desire to seek out Jesus. Uh, we go back to the initial healing. The man, you know, is, is strangely silent and unresponsive to this miracle. He doesn't leap for joy. There's no marveling at this miracle. It's matter of fact, he stands up, he grabs his bed, he starts to walk, and he loses track of where Jesus goes. He, it's like he wasn't even interested in talking to him. It's, like, it's almost like it, it, it was an, an entitlement that Jesus had to heal him. Uh, and the man's like, it's about time I'm healed, you know, and that's all he can think of. He's not thinking of, of, of who is this man that speaks, and I'm made whole after 38 years. All this man had to do was speak to me and I was made whole from the disease that he had. Now Jesus finds him again, finds him in the temple and said unto him, behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now Lord shippers love this passage. They love to abuse it. And they say, see, look at this. Behold, thou art made whole. Jesus tells this man to sin no more. See, Ron, you've got to repent of your sins right here, man. Black and white, baby. Lord, Lord. <laughs> Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Lord, Lord. They say, you must sin no more, Ron, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So Jesus was uh, teaching repentance of sins. Uh, for salvation here. And of course, that is absolutely the furthest thing from the truth. What is Jesus saying here to this man? Is he saying to him, literally, go and do not commit another sin? Is he really saying that if you commit another sin, and he says sin no more. He didn't say, stop, stop sinning as much, lest a worse thing come unto thee, which is what these sin repenters uh, that's their ultimate goal. They bring down the standard so they can at least try and hope to meet the standard. Uh, Jesus didn't say, uh, sin a little bit less. Don't sin so much, man. Ease off the throttle, the sin throttle, baby, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now think about it. What is worse than 38 years being crippled? What is Jesus talking about here? that you'll go blind and be crippled if you keep sinning? How can that make any sense at all when the Pharisees and everyone else, they're, they're functioning and walking around. They've sinned like this, man. They're sinners too, and yet they're not crippled. So why aren't they crippled? Why aren't they all crippled? Why isn't all humanity crippled and, and diseased physically? Because we have sinned. Well, because that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The worst thing is the hellfire. He's speaking now of the spiritual death, of the lake of fire, which will in fact come upon those who sin. And what is the sin he's referring to? Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now this, first of all, very clearly indicates that this man had not believed in Jesus Christ. Because had he believed in Jesus Christ, as Jesus has already stated, that he has passed out of death into life, shall never perish. But for this man, there is still an opportunity that he could perish. 
He says, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The potential was still there that this man could end up in the lake of fire. So therefore, because we are saved forever, once we have eternal life, we will never perish. We know that this individual man at this point had not believed upon Jesus Christ. As John had stated in John chapter 20, yeah, verse 20, verse 30 and 31. uh, He had not believed that Jesus the Christ, the son of God, because in believing he would have life through his name. This man is being warned by Jesus, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And that worse thing is the lake of fire. So now what is this sin? Is Jesus saying that we have to stop sinning in order to to have eternal life and to avoid the hell fire uh, uh, of the condemned? No, of course not. How can we say that? John writes in his epistle, 1 John, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Folks, we continue to sin. So what's this? If, if, if that's the requirement, sin no more. If sin no more is the requirement to avoid hellfire, then guess what? We're all going to hell because none of us have, quote, sinned no more, unquote. So what is Jesus talking about? We have to think about this, folks. You have to think this stuff through. What is he, is he saying here? Sin no more. Well, the sin that he's addressing is unbelief. He is telling the man that he must stop. Now, it is veiled. It's, he, he's not nearly as clear as he was to the woman at the well uh, or even the dialogue with Nicodemus where he overtly says that you must believe. Uh, believe upon Christ. Believe upon him. Believe upon the Son of Man. Believe upon the Son of God and you'll have everlasting life. He doesn't even give this detail to this man, but very clearly what he's saying is sin no more is repent. Repent of this pharisaical Judaism. And we see this guy, he, he's got a soft spot in his heart for these Pharisees, uh, these rulers of the Jews, because he goes back and tells them where Jesus is. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Again, he doesn't dialogue. The woman at the well is engaging and asking questions and and desiring this water that will she'll never thirst again. She's engaging and intrigued and desirous and thirsting for more from Jesus the Christ. This man, nope. I found where you're at. Now I can go back and report you to the authorities. And notice this. This is kind of an ironic thing. Verse 15 says, The man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus which had made him whole. This man, just an hour before, couldn't depart anywhere. He's impotent, laying at a pool, hoping someone can carry him the the five feet to drop him into the pool that he can be healed. Now he's using his healed legs to depart from Jesus rather than thanking him or engaging him or what must I do to be saved? You know, there's no desire for dialogue with Jesus whatsoever. And now he uses his legs that have been made whole to go and tell the enemies of Jesus where who it was and where he is so that they can come and rebuke him and persecute him because he violated their tradition by commanding this man made whole to carry his pallet. You know, my wife has a a pallet she does exercises on, and I'll I'll move it for her. It's easily rolled up and carried around. That's exactly what I picture for this man. He's been laying on it. Imagine this thing with straw in it, you know, this, this ramshackle pallet that he had, you know, impotent man, unable to walk. And he lifts this thing up. It's a piece of cake to carry. And they're furious that he's doing this. Uh, And now this man uses his own legs. The irony. This man departed using his restored legs to serve as an informant to the religious crowd. And this is the notes I had written down here. Who would, who would, (laughs) the religious, the very religious crowd. Okay. Now he's using it. This is the irony. Okay. He's using his 
restored legs to serve now as an informant to the religious crowd who would have preferred the man still be lame rather than to be healed and carrying his pallet. I mean, what a twisted and blinded mindset even this man who's been healed has. He does not believe, and he's going to report to the authorities, report on the man that just made him whole by merely speaking it, by commanding the healing. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. It's just amazing. Verse 16, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, and they sought to slay him, because he had done these things. See, now they're pissed off at Jesus with a fury and a hatred that, uh, that, that is rivaled by Cain, him, only by Cain and, uh, and these, uh, these antichrists that are furious at the simplicity and the work that Jesus has done here in healing this man. Um, so it, notice here, it's no longer just the... Um, the carrying of the of the mattress or the the pad, he said they were they were ready to slay him because he had done these things. So he, they're upset that he healed the man on the Sabbath day. They're upset with the man that he carried, but now their fury is directed at Jesus for healing the man on the Sabbath day, and for commanding the man to carry his pallet. Now again, this man <laughs> doesn't even see what he's doing. He he's he's siding with the people who in their fury and hatred for Jesus would prefer that that man abide in that state that he'd been in for 38 years rather than him be whole and carrying his pallet. Okay. Now we go to verse 17. Jesus answered them. <clears throat> now the, the, they have caught up with Jesus and they're persecuting him. And Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. So, Jesus is now, he's throwing down on these people and he's revealing, you think you're mad now, uh, Pharisees? Uh, I'm declaring myself to be one with the Father. Um, my Father worketh hitherto and I work. We'll see next week how they, or in the next couple of weeks, how they will um, seek to stone him because he, make, he being a man makes himself to be God, they say, in you know, their understanding, uh, that he is blaspheming. And he did make that assertion, but uh, it wasn't blasphemy because it was true. He's the son of man, the son of God. So um, now I want to talk just briefly. I've kind of been all over the place on this. And uh, anyway, it's kind of disjointed, but I want to wrap up and come full circle with this being made whole, this concept of being made whole or shalom or peace. And peace means when two divergent parties or, or, or uh, hostile parties are reconciled, are brought together to one. There's a harmony now, a oneness, a unity between previously warring factions. And so I want to kind of wrap up on this point of wholeness. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 and 21 kind of deals with this. The scripture says, uh, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. In place of Christ, we are beseeching and praying you. Be ye reconciled to God. Now again, the word reconciled means to make good again, to bring together. It's a synonym for being made whole, which is what Jesus did for the body of this man. He made his legs and his body whole. Before he couldn't walk, he, his legs were dysfunctional, all right? They were separated from their functional uh, uh, design, and he couldn't walk. And then he made him whole so that he could walk. So now we are recon to be reconciled to God means to be made whole again, to bring good, to bring together. Uh, for he, for God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, this is how you escape um, the worst thing, uh, something worse coming upon you, more than, than the 38 years of being crippled, the lake of fire. You must have the righteousness of God. And that's what Jesus means by sin no more. 
receive him as the Messiah is the appeal that Jesus is implying. And yes, it's veiled, but this man was blinded. And, uh, and he goes to, to, to report Jesus as an informant. Um, but this is how we receive the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, God the Father, made the Son to be sin for us who knew no sin, in order that we, the sinners, might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Um, so this is the essence of reconciliation and wholeness, that we would be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 4 and 5, the scripture says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So for a person who is working, a religious man, he is not, uh, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, when we believe upon Jesus Christ, our faith is counted for righteousness independent of any work. The text is clear. But to him that worketh not, but instead of working, he believes. So therefore, faith is not a work that we perform. He believes on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted, reckoned, imputed to his account as or for righteousness. So in God's accounting system, when a, when a man believes upon Jesus Christ, when he is obedient to the gospel message, he believes that gospel message. He's not disobedient to the gospel, which is unbelief. He obeys the gospel. He, his faith is counted as righteousness. We're to believe upon Jesus Christ. And the moment we believe, our faith is counted by God as righteousness. Now, the religious man will not see it that way. He's going to come to that. What are you doing carrying your mat? Right? They're not going to say, uh, you know, hey, you've been made whole. Praise God. How is that? How did that happen? How can I get some of that? No, they're, you're carrying your mattress, you easy believer. Look at you, full of hypocrisy and sin. Look at your life. It's a shambles. <laughs> right? Um, but they don't understand God's reckoning system, that faith is counted for righteousness. Faith in Jesus Christ is what brings spiritual reconciliation or bringing back to God and a wholeness, a made whole uh, that that results from that. And 1 Corinthians 6, 17 <clears throat> clarifies this, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So when you believe the gospel, our spirit is united, immersed, baptized into the spirit of Christ, and we become one spirit. And therefore, we are at that point reconciled to God. We are one in Jesus Christ. And now his virtue, his righteousness is our righteousness. And his eternal life is ours. We partake of his righteousness and his eternal life by faith. And that's how we are made whole. That phrase has been used over and over and over and over and over again. And as I thought about it, Back way back up here in verse three, that in these in these five porches of the pool of Bethesda lay a great multitude of impotent folk. I thought, man, what a what a definition of the world. The world is filled with a great multitude of impotent, dysfunctional, diseased, infirm people who need to be made whole. And how are we made whole? How do the impotent meet the omnipotent and become whole by coming to Jesus Christ by faith, by simply believing the gospel. And the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead for our justification, that God has been satisfied. His anger has been appeased by the propitiatory re re reconciliation the conciliatory, conciliatory work of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. And the wrath of God has been appeased. And we now have peace or shalom or wholeness with God again through simply believing in Jesus Christ. Not of works, lest any man should boast. No, it's not of works, but it is by grace that we're saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
So folks, I, I've really um, come full circle here. And uh, it's uh, if you stuck it out this long, <laughs> God bless you. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think it's important that we understand this concept of being made whole in Christ and the Sabbath of rest. We don't work. And it's a if you work, if you're working for your salvation in any way, shape, or form, even if it's the equivalent of just picking up sticks, then you have corrupted the grace of God. You have violated the Sabbath rest required for salvation, and now you'll be judged on your merit, and you will perish in the lake of fire. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Cease from your efforts. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be made whole, and you shall be saved. Okay, that's all I got today. God bless. Thanks. Bye.